My name is Nick Davidson. Uh, really excited to be here today talking to you guys. This, is, this should be a lot of fun. Um, I am uh, very excited to have Brian Tinsman uh, being my grand inquisitor after we're done here. So uh, when I was told I had about 20, 25 minutes to cover a topic, um, you know, some people, when, they, when they're told they have 20 minutes, think, well, I'm going to talk about the history of, and future of game design. And I thought, maybe a bit too big. I'll leave that to Brian. Uh, I'm going to talk about something very specific and very tactical uh, to deal with when you are in the act of designing games. Because yes, although we do have a grand responsibility to the future and to our craft, uh, frequently we're actually just making products. Um, these are some places I've done that. Uh, these are my obligatory bio slides. Spent many years out at Turbine, where I made a variety of MMOs, uh, which is the coast for a couple of years, and the Amazing Society out in Issaquah. Some games I've worked on that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, currently working with a group called uh, Critical Hit Consulting. We provide uh, pre-production and post-mortem services to game companies. Um, that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, is everyone here familiar with the Alphabet game? Has anyone played the Alphabet game? Uh, OK, the Alphabet game, the Alphabet game, it generally, you're, you're driving along, and you, you try to see something out the window that starts with the letter A, and you say, ah! an aardvark. And you, nobody else in the car can use that same aardvark, and they're like, ah, ah, sign that said Bothell. Mm, that starts with B. And you try to get to Z before the other people in the car. Do you think this is a good game? Do you think this represents good game design? OK. Has anyone, yes, has anyone played the alphabet game while they were not in a car? Anyone familiar with this game? <laughs> yeah, state schools. Uh, anyone think this is a good game? Does it represent good game design? <laughs> because it's got beer, it represents good game design. Would you recommend this game to these guys? OK, that guy's a pro. <laughs> Trick question. She might. <laughs> Future pro, we hope. Uh, here's another example. This is Bejeweled Blitz. This is one of PopCap's games. Um, largely considered to represent great game design. Uh, it's been a hit on mobile devices. It's great on the PC. Uh, it does very, very well on Facebook. They released it on Xbox Live, and it flopped. So what does that mean for the quality of the game design in that case? In all of these cases, in the abstract, do these represent elements of good game design? Exactly right. Because in the abstract, there are no good game designs. Abstraction makes game design impossible. There are big picture questions to be answered about the field of game design, and these are important questions. But in the act of designing, there are no good game designs. Abstraction makes that impossible. But what is possible are good designs for a specific platform, good designs for a specific project timeline, good designs for a monetization plan, unless you're you know, doing it just for, for, for fun and, and self-satisfaction, uh, good designs for a team's capabilities. There have been many great designs that the, that the team uh, didn't have the, the resources to execute on. And good designs for an audience. And that, it's the last one that I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail today. Because one of the things that will make you a better game designer is learning to design to specific constraints. Constraints, not freedom, create great games. So I'm going to talk about three elements of audience-driven design. Uh, this is the most useful when you are dealing with an audience that is very dissimilar from yourself. We're going to talk about the perf perfection principle. We're going to talk about the ways in which game designers are a really bad example of an audience. Uh, and we're going to talk about some specific tools and techniques that have both historically been used to try to uh, identify audience-driven design uh, and some that I think work even better. Um, but we're going to have sort of a theme today of talking about uh, 16th century Japan. Uh, that's, not, that's not made up. We're actually going to have a theme today of talking about 16th century Japan. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little story about Kyudo, the way of the bow, Zen archery. Um, in 16th century Japan, the, the shogun uh, called to his castle a variety of 
uh, the best archers in the land. And what he did was he, he said, all right, we're, we'll have some elimination trials, but I want three best archers on the field. Uh, we're going to determine who is the best once and for all. So 100 yards, yards away from uh, the line where they all shot from, uh, stuck a pole in the ground, and from that pole hung a windsock. It was a koi fish. And it was blowing in the breeze, and he said, all right, that's the target. Your goal is to shoot your arrow from 100 yards away, pierce the windsock. And in case of ties, the bullseye is the eye of that fish. The first archer walked up the line, and he pulled back his bow, and he waited for a moment, and he fired. And it landed right next to the pole. A very good shot at 100 yards. Second guy walks up to the line, pulls back his bow, wait, waits a little longer, fires the arrow. Just brushes by the tail. Doesn't quite pierce, but it's very, very close. Third guy walks up, doesn't even hesitate, pulls back the bow, fires, goes right through the eye. And the shogun afterwards asked each of the men, when you were up at the line, what did you see? And the first man said, well, I stood there, you know, in this beautiful countryside, and I saw the mountains in the background, and I saw the rivers in the forest, and I saw the clouds in the sky, and I saw, I think, some birds flying by, and in the middle of it, my target, and I took it all in, and I pulled my, my string back, and I fired. The shogun asked the second man, what did you see? The second man said, well, I saw all of that, but then I just kind of narrowed my focus, and, you know, I'll, I just narrowed my focus in on the pole and the windsock fluttering in the breeze. He asked the third man, what did you see before you fired? And he said, only the eye. I only saw the eye. And that, in essence, is the perfection principle. If your game isn't perfect for somebody, it isn't going to be particularly good for anybody. All great games are somebody's favorite game. And that's the person you should be most interested in reaching. There is a myth of the general audience game. All games that are successful have a very good understanding of who their audience is, and the, de they design to that audience. I actually use archery metaphors uh, in my design documentation when I'm talking about audience uh, differentiation. I divide out into what I consider my primary, secondary, and tertiary audience. Uh, who, who is the bullseye audience for any particular game that you're designing? Which specific demographic is going to be most excited about what you have to do? Uh, this is an example from my most recent game, Marvel Superhero Squad Online. Uh, just won an award yesterday. I'm very excited about that. Uh, it is a MMO uh, primarily targeted at boys 6 to 11. And although I have some distant memory of being a boy 6 to 11, uh, I am no longer a great example of that target audience. Uh, even on my best days. Uh, the secondary audience that we identified were the Marvel dads. Uh, interesting phenomenon about uh, comic books is that comic books have aged up with the audience. Uh, and now you have men between 35 and 45 who have kids of their own who are now the age where the same age they were when they started reading comic books. That's what age their sons are. But if they went to get the latest issue of the Avengers and brought it home, they're like, eh, too violent, too many boobs, too much blood. Uh, and they could not share that, uh, that, that hobby, those characters, with their sons. So there's a generational problem there. So part of what we tried to address was a game that bridged that gap. So the Marvel dad was a great example of a secondary audience. Tertiary audience, casual MMO players, people who might have an affinity for the characters and for the gameplay style. But again, tertiary. What this does is, as a game designer, this lets you create a bunch of logic gates for decisions that you're going to need to make. Uh, logic gate number one is very, very simple. If it benefits your primary audience, do it, even if it harms your secondary and tertiary audiences. You are looking to create bullseyes. You are looking to create somebody's favorite game. And you don't do that by diluting your game design. Second principle is kind of the corollary. If it harms your primary audience, don't do it, even if it strongly benefits your secondary and tertiary audiences. Uh, there, there, was a, uh, there was an example that, that was given at Wizards of the Coast, which is no longer a very good example, but I'll use it anyway, and then I'll provide you why it's not a very good example. Uh, it was called the, the Deadwood example, because there was a game that Wizards of the Coast published called Deadwood uh, that involved zombies and cowboys. And the idea was, we're going to get all the people who love zombies and all the people who love cowboys, they're all going to buy this game. And in the end, only people who like zombie cowboys bought the game. Uh, 
Now, I, I use this as, as an example, and then Red Dead Redemption does the, the zombie expansion pack, and it's really successful, so I can't use it anymore. But I do. It's weird. Third, <laughs> third logic gate looks a little bit like this. Uh, if, a if a decision would benefit your secondary or tertiary audiences without impacting your primary audience, do it. But keep in mind that in any game development project, resources are finite, and if you are pri prioritizing those features above that which benefits your primary audience, uh, you're making a mistake. So who's got two thumbs and makes the most classic game design mistake of them all? <laughs> this guy. Uh, and that mistake is as follows. This is a rule that I see people follow, and it leads them into trouble every single time when information about the audience is unknown or unavailable. Assume that the audience has the same preferences as the game designer. This is a really easy trap to fall into. Uh, we know ourselves reasonably well, better than most people, I would imagine. Uh, we know what we like, we know what we dislike, uh, and we assume that others are like us. I mean, hey, we play games, our audience plays games. Clearly, uh, if I need to fill in the blanks, I'll just do what I would prefer. We assume by building the game that we, as game designers, want to play, we will reach an audience. Let me assure you that this is the farthest from the truth. Uh, game designers are weird. We're a weird bunch of people. We have uh, a lot of traits that even hardcore game audiences uh, tend to lack to some degree or another. We spend a lot of time thinking about games. Even hardcore players probably, uh, in many cases, don't think as much about games while they are not playing games. We care a lot about mechanics and narrative. We, we have a, we've built up a vocabulary for mechanics and narrative, uh, and again, lost on even a lot of hardcore game players. We appreciate complexity and depth. Uh, there are definitely game designers games out there uh, that game designers play religiously and don't do terribly well in, in the general marketplace. I'm glad these games get made. I find them a lot of fun. Uh, these aren't the games I recommend that you go out and make. We place a high value on originality. We are in a creative field. We value the creative. We value the new. But many audiences value security. They value mastery. The idea that I can walk into a new scenario and bring enough knowledge with me that I'm going to you know, skip, skip the, the difficult learning curve. I'm going to be able to apply earned mastery to uh, future gameplay. We engage in very long game playing sessions. Uh, the average gameplay session that a game designer is willing to engage in, much, much, much longer, sometimes 10 hours a day uh, when we're playtesting our own stuff. Uh, that, that level of patience does not exist outside of us. And we spend a significant amount of our, our money on those games, all ways in which we are bad, bad examples when we are trying to determine what an audience is interested in. So just throw out some words here. What are some attributes of a great game designer? Anything. Creativity. Creativity. Good one. Listening. Listening. Insight. Insight. Observant. Uh, observant, innovative. These are all great. Uh, and I think a lot of people would agree that these are great elements, uh, attributes for a game designer to possess. But here's one that I think serves the designer best in this regard. And it's not one that I, I hear mentioned very often. Brian actually got kind of close. Uh, Empathy, the ability to intellectually identify with the emotions of another, to vicariously experience feelings, thoughts, attitudes. Empathy is not an innate talent. It's not something that you're born with or you lack. Uh, empathy is vitally important to the art of game design, but the good news is it can be trained. Empathy can be learned. Empathy is something that you can develop. And in the last section here, I'm going to walk through some uh, exercises to help you develop uh, what I consider uh, the core of a game designer's empathy. Here's one of the easiest ways to create audience associations. I also think it's one of the worst. Uh, it's one of the most dangerous. Human beings put a lot of stock into uh, story and anecdote. Uh, we trust, you know, my, my cousin's sister uh, had this happen to her, so now she never buys this product. Anecdotes resonate very, very strongly with us uh, in, in the way that statistics don't. 
okay? If, if your you know, second cousin had this experience with this product, and then on the other hand, you're looking at statistics that say, oh, actually this product is incredibly safe and Consumer Reports gives it, gives it all these great reviews and you know, all, all, all that good stuff. We have an emotional attachment to anecdote more than we do to statistics. There are some really good evolutionary reasons for this. Um, although it's actually why, uh, why some sociologists think that the, the, uh, the Vikings died out in Iceland. Uh, they starved to death while they were surrounded by an ocean full of delicious fish. But there are records that there was a, there was a narrative, that there, were, there was an anecdote that the fish are no good here. And probably what happened was a few generations back, uh, somebody went out fishing, caught a, a load of bad fish, got food poisoning, and the assumption was, the anecdote became, the narrative became, the fish are bad here, don't eat the fish. And they starved to death, surrounded by an ocean full of food. Anecdotes are dangerous. When working on my last project, I got a lot of feedback from members of the team who said things along the lines of, uh, you know, when my son was eight, he was playing World, World of Warcraft, he was playing complicated console games, he helped his friends sync up their phones with our, with our house Wi-Fi, and then they would go on to encourage us to make the game more complicated because, honestly, that's what they as the game developer wanted. Um, I have no doubt that that kid could, in fact, do all of those things. But again, that was a, the child of two game developers who grew up with the latest gadgets surrounding him in the house, and uh, you know, his parents encouraged him to use them. And again, anecdote is great, but it will as often identify outliers because outliers are more interesting anecdotes. So I don't recommend this too much. How about the focus group? Publishers love focus groups. Man, do they love focus groups. Uh, if you're not familiar with how the focus group works, uh, you take a small representative sample of your audience, you ask them a bunch of questions and uh, see how the audience will react to the game and you draw some far-reaching conclusions from it. Lots of fun. Uh, my recommendation with focus groups is somebody who has been involved in a lot of them. Uh, they're only useful if you actually let them play your game. They're only useful if you pretty much turn off the audio and just watch what they do. Uh, because the process of questioning within a focus group is pretty useless. People understand what a focus group is. We've been doing these long enough that people understand the innate game contained within a focus group. Uh, I swear, you can see the gears turning in people's heads as they, as they are trying to figure out, what do I need to say to get you to hear the thing that will make you do the thing that I want you to do? Okay? That has nothing to do with the question you asked, by the way. Uh, that could be the topic of an another talk entirely, uh, but the focus group tends to break down uh, because people will frequently jump to a conclusion they will think, I had a bad experience here. Here is the solution that I just came up with after seeing your game for 30 seconds. Uh, as opposed to articulating the problem that they experienced. So the focus group is great when you are trying to identify, uh, if, if you're actually looking at uh, people using your product. And you know, more important than what they say is if you've got a camera on their face and you can watch their, watch their facial expressions. That will tell you way, way more than uh, the, the question and answer will at the end. This is a technique that I've used, however, and I, I find it much more useful than the other two combined. It's something called interest mapping. You can pretty much do this uh, with, with Google at this point because we are a, a demographic crazed society right now. Uh, and if you, even if you just get close to some of the, some of the top, uh, top items that you're searching for, you'll be able to go through an exercise that I find much, much, much more useful. So uh, again, it's been a long time since I've been an eight-year-old male, so uh, let's try to figure out what an eight-year-old male wants in a game design. Uh, start with some un seemingly unrelated interests. Did a little bit of searching on you know, what's hot on iTunes for eight-year-olds, uh, anything off of Radio Disney, and the song Peanut Butter Jelly Time. <laughs> peanut Butter Jelly Time, Peanut Butter Jelly Time. Peanut butter jelly time with a baseball bat. Uh, what games are they playing? Top games for eight-year-old males, Pokemon, Club Penguin, Lego Star Wars. Came up on, on most of the searches that I saw. What sort of activities are they doing that are not specifically game, uh, games? They're in school, they're playing team sports, a lot of soccer, a lot of TV. 
Oh, and a lot of gaming, it turns out. So that's good news. That tells you that you're at least on the right track. Take a lot of these search results and then try to figure out what do these mean in terms of uh, the, the emotional reactions that are being provoked by these disparate interests that you've mapped out. Peanut butter jelly time is all about nonsensical humor. It's funny, and I would have a really hard time explaining why. I guess there's a dancing banana, and it's, it's catchy, and it's, it's upbeat. It's, <laughs> it is. It's funny. You laugh. Uh, so nonsensical humor is clearly an emotional reaction uh, that's being generated by this affinity. What does it mean when somebody is playing and enjoying Pokemon? Well, I'll just pick a couple of them. Affinity for collection mechanics. Ability to, cra to grasp progression mechanics. At a basic level, if you're playing Pokemon Black White, you are, uh, you are, you're doing so because you have an affinity for collection and the ability to grasp progression. Lego Star Wars, great game, button mashing combat, simple puzzle solving. Okay, these are some elements that are resonating with the audience. Club, Club Penguin, basic online socialization. I actually did a, I just captured hours and hours and hours of logs from chat within Club Penguin. Uh, like 80% of it were one of two words. Can you guess what the two words? The uh, lol. lol. Yes. And the other one? Oh, it was all hi and lol. <laughs> so they were just saying hello to each other, and this was hilarious. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> at that age, at that age, this, this kind of gives you an emotional sense for uh, the, the amount of socialization that, uh, that, that's going on and the value that the kids are getting out of it. It's not so much that they really want to have conversations. They're not making friends, but they appreciate the value of seeing and be, being seen. Uh, they're playing a lot of team sports at this age. What does that mean? Role-based cooperation. Uh, the goalie does something very different than the midfielder. I guess a couple years younger, and it's just this big mass of kids chasing after the ball. But uh, you know, the, the idea of the second baseman doing something different than the catcher uh, Role-based cooperation is starting to be a, a emotional element that starts to emerge at this age. Like, okay, great. I may have some vague memory of doing that myself, but clearly this is a better, uh, a better map of activities. And with just a few word changes, you're looking at a, the, at a vision document for the game design. You know, we want to focus on nonsensical and slapstick humor. We want to focus on collection mechanics, basic character progression, combat that's fast-paced and simple, communication not required for success, players taking on specific roles and jobs. That looks a heck of a lot like uh, the first paragraph of a lot of uh, game design documents that I've written and seen. And I can tell you that this is something that an eight-year-old male is going to want to play. Empathy achieved. Bam. Let's talk about it some more. I'd like to introduce my grand inquisitor for the evening, Mr. Brian Tinsman. <laughs> Brian, take it away. That's the idea. It's your conference. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> It sure did sound like an anecdote, but you'll remember it. And actually, my, my goal was not to educate you on a fact, but to instill an emotional reaction. And if you remember the Viking anecdote, then it was successful. Ah. You didn't answer the question. Uh, what book did I read that in? Uh, I read it in a book, so it must be true. Um, that might have been in Collapse. Um, the... Jared Diamond, is that who that is? Um, fantastic book, recommended highly, um, and it may have that story in it. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. It seems like a lot of this is the response to market forces, mm -hmm. and I was, I was wondering the reaction to the games that actually create their own market. Um, is, is there any difference there? So, the question was, you know, this, this is about designing to a specific market, reacting to market forces. Uh, you know, there, there are games that, that create their own market. Um, you can do that. It is a low percentage shot. Uh, you know, games that, that have been moving into, uh, especially the social and the casual space, absolutely created their own market. But not really. When you look at the, the core demographic of the gamer that's playing Cityville and Farmville at this point, 
Uh, a smaller subset of them were playing uh, a lot of hidden object games and, uh, you know, match three games and a lot of the, the downloadable games, the $10 download industry kind of got overrun by the, the social game industry. The audience demographic is almost identical. So it's not that they created a new audience, but living on a social platform uh, made them much, much better at reaching more of that audience. I think there, there are very few instances where a new audience is absolutely created because we're all playing games. More of us are admitting it now, but no, no fewer of us are actually doing it. No more of us are actually doing that. Yes? Is there anything wrong with saying, I'm going to make a game that I like? No, no, absolutely not. And somebody else might like it too, or they can't tell me what they like. There's, there's no, absolutely... Yes, you can, you can design a game for an audience of one. And in fact, you can use a lot of the same principles to design a great game for yourself. Uh, I design a game for myself every time I drive home from work uh, about you know, which cars I want to pass and you know, trying to stay under the speed limit so I don't get pulled over. Like, we, we design game-like elements for ourselves all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I could sell exactly one copy of that game uh, if, if I were interested in doing so, or maybe more if I have friends that are, are, are enough like me and I can get just a little bit of distribution out there. So it, it's not so much that it is a bad thing to design games for you and people like you. I highly encourage it. But if you are in the profession of a game designer and you are doing this as part of your day job and you're expected to meet some sales target, uh, maybe not the best route to, route to take. Yes, sir? Uh, moving on from your professional principle. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we are. And you know what? Uh, there, there are definitely people playing Tetris today who have other puzzle game choices available to them uh, and for whom Tetris is the perfect game. And, and it won't die. Uh, it may, a lot of MMO players are like this, too. All of the first-generation MMOs are still running. All of them are still running. EverQuest is still running, Ultima Online is still running, Asheron's Call is still running. Heck, there are even Meridian 59 servers kicking around. Uh, they, they were repurchased and hosted, I think, in, in Eastern Europe or something. Uh, but all of these games are still around because they were the perfect game for somebody. And they will be playing those games until they shut off the lights. Uh, so Tetris falls in, in, into the same category. For whatever combination of events led to Tetris being the best game for somebody, it still is. And they will be playing you know, different web versions of Tetris. I suspect it has something to do with the song. It's a good, <laughs> it's a good song. Uh, and, and same with Minecraft. Uh, it, it does some, Minecraft is going to be very, very hard to replace. There is a unique experience there. And I don't think it created a new audience. I think it, it definitely appealed to people who didn't realize they had a favorite game before. In, uh, in film, you, you sometimes think about, you, you hear about uh, producers wanting to create the four quadrant film. Yes. That's the one that deals, is it men and women, young and old? Is, is that how they break it down, I think? I think so, yeah. Something like that, right? And if, if you can hit you know, each of those segments, you're going to have a, a big hit. And that's, that concept's in a strong parallel between mm -hmm. movies and games, but that seems to imply that uh, the the way to have a success is to try and uh, hit as many people as you want. Do you think it's possible to do that in, in games? Uh, Call of Duty Black Ops sold more than any other console game in the history of console games, and that is a one-quadrant game. Uh, that, is, that is squarely a one-quadrant game. Uh, you know, all, all of the social network games, uh, you know, looking at the, the demographics on them, you're looking at 85% or more female uh, and a reasonably broad range of, of ages but that kind of feels like a one to two quadrant game as well. So although I think it's possible to make the four quadrant game, uh, I don't think those have been the greatest successes in the in industry. I think it, to that point, I think that games and movies are very different experiences mm -hmm. in sort of the amount of yourself you put into them. And so from like just an observational point, 
four quadrant thing can exist, but from a, I'm going to involve myself heavily in this and spend a lot of time playing it, and it's going to be right. my favorite activity to do for more than five hours a day, right? That's got to be a one quadrant experience. Part of part an element that I find that that helps define some of the best games is that they become part of your identity. And part of identity is not just defining the positive space, but defining the negative space. So the most attractive games are that way because you know they're for you because they're not for that guy over there. So designing the four-quadrant game would work counter to the idea of creating a game that somebody can associate their identity with. And again, a completely different talk topic that I would, I would love to go on for another 20 minutes about. Yes? Mm -hmm. What if, does the primary audience always have to be like something really specific? Or like what if I have a really broad primary audience? Like would I need a Sure. Uh, if you have a really broad primary audience, uh, to me that's a bit of a warning sign. Uh, I, I like working with very tightly defined primary audiences. Sometimes you will do a fantastic job with your secondary and tertiary audiences in addition to your primary audience. Uh, I, I look at a lot of the, the Wii titles, the, the first party Wii titles, had a primary audience in mind. They, they absolutely did. Uh, you can tell just in the, in the level of communication that they use, the, the amount of, of iconic representation uh, that, that you see in these games. They clearly had a target in mind, but succeeded in part because they were almost as successful with their secondary and tertiary audiences as they were with their primary. But I don't think they achieved that, that by taking their eyes off of that primary defined audience. Yes, sir. So I hear a lot when we talk about design themes, especially if it's a sequel to a game, that you shouldn't just take in what the audience wants because uh, they say like some the audience doesn't know what they really want. So I'm wondering is when you're designing a game, how much should you worry about just pandering to the audience? Uh, I'm not gonna use the word pandering, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to I'm gonna quibble one particular phrase. The audience does know what they want. They don't necessarily know how to communicate what they want. And uh, what I found very, very useful, um, and, and especially larger companies are getting much, much, much better at this. Uh, Microsoft Labs, when, when designing the, the Halo sequels, uh, they, they have wonderful uh, user experience measurement laboratories where they can essentially tell by a heat map of where characters are at any given time over time, and they can see hot spots where people are lingering longer in an area of the level than they think they should, which, which probably means that there's something confusing about that particular area. We're getting amazing at metrics. We're getting amazing at you know, analyzing what gameplay behaviors are all about. Um, Zynga is you know, two, three iterations ahead of the pack with this. But there's a very good way to model player behavior. And that is, in a lot of ways, more useful than modeling uh, player desire, because player desire has to go through a couple filters to get to you. So getting back to the original question, uh, should you worry about that? Yes, absolutely. And it's not pandering. It's going back to you know, Halo 2 and examining the ways in which Halo 2 was played and the emotional peaks that were achieved by Halo play and trying to uh, expand upon that, build upon that as a starting point, understand where you started so you know where you're going. It's not pandering so much. Yes, sir. Um, what's your term for, um, like the industry term for games that uh, require you to interact with the emotions, like the aesthetic? Uh, I don't know, is there a term for that? Uh, Motion, motion gaming, I've heard that. Active gaming, physical gaming. Waving your arms around like an idiot gaming. So, again, I could go off on, a, on another thing here. Platform-based design is just as important as audience-based design. If you go back to the there we go. Uh, platform is just as important as audience. And uh, you know, I, I kind of gave a teaser question in there with Bejeweled Blitz and Xbox Live. Uh, Bejeweled Blitz is great for touch interfaces. Swap two things. 
Part of the brilliance of that game, just as a little aside, is that there's one verb involved. Switch. That's the, you have one verb to worry about. It's you know, brilliant, brilliant in its elegance. Uh, the verb switch is not conducive to a dual stick eight button controller. It's just not, especially when you're dealing with Bejeweled Blitz, which has the element of speed and accuracy as a, as a, as a very important part of the, the game mechanic. So great on the mobile device, great with the mouse, uh, great on the tablet, not so great on the platform. So the platform will have great games built for the platform. It will also have bad ports onto the platform that don't belong on the platform. You see this all the time. Um, do I think there's a, there's a future for it? Yes. Do I think it's going to be what you know, drives uh, you know, the, the future of, of gaming in the next 10 years? Not, not really. I think that, that we're really seeing that uh, the, the elements that, that are in common with all of you know, the defining games of you know, the last couple of years and the next couple of years will be the, the, uh, the connections and the, and the utilization of the social graph that you already have in place. at some point having a room that's set up with you know connect sensors all along the ceiling that track the movements of everybody in the room all at the same time and that they all have to work in unison somehow to manipulate what's going on the screen like that would be a new type of gaming that we've right. never experienced before kind of team mass team based uh, body sensor gaming but of course Got time for a couple more questions? Yes? Could you give an example, going back to your bullseye illustration, mm -hmm. could you give an example of a design decision that benefits your primary audience but is harmful or not so great for your secondary and tertiary audience? Uh, sure. The best example I've got is uh, just how much time we spent on fart emotes. A lot. <laughs> we spent a lot of time on uh, the, the slapstick comedy that actually turned off some of the parents a little bit and uh, was generally emotionally flat with the tertiary audience. But man, you, you put you know, Iron Man making a, a little sound in your game, and the kid just hits the button over and over and over. And the first few times, you're, he's laughing and you're laughing, hooray, it works. And then he keeps doing it. And you're like, how many, how many times is Iron Man going to play the armpit? I don't, I don't even know. Uh, so, but, but there are a lot of things uh, just in terms of the level of, of communication. We went through our UI and we stripped out words wherever we could and replaced them with icons. Um, you know, and when, when you're in that 6 to 11 range, you've got a wide range of reading abilities. Uh, we tried to make sure that you know, there, there were features that we refused to do because they would have required a two-handed control, mouse, mouse drag for camera and keyboard for, for motion that was just beyond the kids. The, the best story I've got from the, the early testing we did with kids, kids, by the way, are the exception to the focus group rule. Once you're under a certain age, you ask them a question, they will tell you exactly what they think with no filter whatsoever and frequently without need, needing to ask them. It's, it actually is wonderful. Um, but uh, there, there was a, a point where, where the, the uh, the child was instructed, okay, so right click on that thing. And the kid clicked on it, and he says, no, 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 right click. And he just looked at the guy like he was from another planet, like, what, 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 what do you mean? He says, oh, the, the mouse has two buttons. And he looked at him like, oh, okay. And he instantly assimilated that information, but up until this point, we just kind of figured everyone knows that a mouse has two buttons. Uh, but that, that level of uh, assumption gets you into you know, the this guy problem. Um, you know, we, we also, the, the thing I'll, I'll close on, it's, it's the most tragic, is that you've got to be very, very careful with what you're presenting in these sessions. Uh, we had a bug in, in our UI. We had one UI element that didn't have the little red X in the corner because all UI elements need the red X in the corner. And this one didn't have it. Uh, so you had to close the window with escape. And, uh, and the, the tester told the little girl, please close the window now. 
and she, the mouse went up to where the, the X should be, and she got panicked, and then she started to cry. And we're all behind the glass like, no, 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 it's not your fault. This is ours. This is our. So yeah, be mindful of your audience, everyone. Thank you. 